acting and particularly how it's changed since 1957 when the uh, first satellite Sputnik 1 and its rocket body was launched. Um, so this is an all sky camera uh, taken in France, I believe, and it shows you a pristine night sky. You can see a few clouds here, the Milky Way going straight overhead. And if it's a really dark site, whoops, let me go back here a minute. And um, so you don't see any satellites in this particular uh, image. Well, I set up a similar, if smaller camera in my uh, driveway in the Seitzer Driveway Observatory. So this is in Burns Park in Ann Arbor. And uh, you don't see as many stars. You see a lot of trees and power lines. You can also see how bright the night sky is. And here you see two satellites. This is the International Space Station, which is streaking in this 15 second exposure. And here's a tumbling rocket body, um, which, is, uh, which is space debris. It's not functional anymore. And when you look up in the night sky, you are looking up into the world's largest junkyard. Um, so what, what got astronomers extremely concerned in the last two years was that in May 9, 2019, SpaceX, Elon Musk, launched the first of his Starlink constellation. And so we could see this string of pearls. Here's one picture of it. Here's another one taken in twilight uh, from uh, Honolulu by T.S. Kelso. And you can see there's not quite all 60, but they're easily visible to the unaided eye, even in bright, uh, bright uh, skies like Ann Arbor, or in the next one is, uh, this was taken over Paris in December of 2019 about 50 kilometers east of Paris, 60 satellites, visual magnitude is third. And so he's circled them, Thierry has circled them here. And um, this got astronomers really concerned because SpaceX was talking about launching 40,000 of them. And other companies were talking about launching tens of thousands of more. And um, so the question then, is this the future of the night sky? Are we gonna have more bright satellites than stars? Um, is this going to happen all night long? Well, so I just like to sort of review where we are on this right now and uh, show you pictures of satellites and things. Um, do we have any uh, questions? And has the presentation come through okay at this point? Presentation's been great on my end, and uh, no questions in the chat yet. Okay, we'll keep going. So. Then it got more than just the unaided eye. This is a image which you may have seen, it's very popular, um, taken back in November of 2019, about a week after the launch of a group of Starlinks. And it was taken from a four meter telescope located at Cerro Tololo in Chile, uh, my favorite observatory. And you can see the trails left by 19 Starlinks crossing the field of view here. It took them four seconds to cross, even though the exposure time was 300 seconds, this was not a planned exposure. Okay, I'm gonna repeat that. This was not a planned exposure. Uh, it was just, they were studying some of the objects in here for science and um, all of a sudden these starlings went across. Now you can see these individual rectangles. Those are the individual detectors. So the, the system here is made up of, I think over 50 individual detectors that are mosaic together uh, to make a focal plane. It's not one gigantic detector, but you can take say like uh, 50 of your DSLRs with more sensitive detectors and put them together. And this is what you get. And this is four times the diameter of the full moon. So this is a, a big telescope. The mirror is four meters in diameter. Uh, it's a very powerful fast system and it's a prototype for what will be coming down in the future. Um, this is another image taken with that same telescope. And um, this was an Atlas Centaur rocket body, which was launched back in 1963. And it's still hanging around up there. It's what we call orbital or space debris. It's no longer functional. And I told you that you're looking up at the world's largest junkyard when you look up. And this is one of those pieces of junk that's uh, still going up there. So this was a 60 second exposure in an R filter. It took this thing just a couple of seconds to cross the field of view. Interesting thing about this satellite 
was when it crossed the field of view, it was saturated, okay? It was brighter than the, um, uh, what do I wanna say, than the detector could handle. You can think of the detector, the individual pixels like a, like a pail. And if you put more water in the pail, eventually it overfills. Well, in this case, this overfilled the pixels uh, at flat top. There's quite a bit of scatter out here. In this particular image, there was a second satellite. This was a Cosmos Soviet dead satellite crossing the field of view. When I tell you there's a lot of junk up there, you're absolutely right. And so why are astronomers concerned about these very bright satellites? You lose information in the picture elements. There's crosstalk in the electronics, there's ghost images, and there's possible residual images. Um, so let me just say about this one, these modern telescopes with these huge cameras are so sensitive and so fast that even though it takes the satellite just a few seconds to cross the field of view and maybe just a few milliseconds to cross each picture element, it still saturates the detector. Um, so even make matters even worse, these large telescopes are so fast that low altitude satellites are out of focus. And so their images are broad, even if they might not be saturated or not. So astronomers have some, uh, some real concerns here. And this is the, the biggest, fastest telescope under construction on the planet today. It's the Vera Rubin Observatory in Chile on the next mountain over from Cerro Tololo, where I uh, showed you the image earlier. Uh, and this is the telescope being lowered into its uh, new dome. And uh, this will run, this is named after the famous astronomer Vera Rubin, who studied dark matter in uh, galaxies. The fact that we don't, we can't detect most of what's in the universe. When you look out with your eye, you only see about 5% of what the universe is actually made of. About 30% is dark matter and another 65% is dark energy. Astronomers are good at coming up with terms. And this is the biggest, fastest telescope uh, coming down the pike. Uh, it's going to run the legacy survey of space and time. This shows the telescope in its assembly hall in Spain. It will survey the entire southern sky every few nights. So it'll do a pair of 15 second exposures, go to the next field, pair of 15 second exposures, go to the next field. It has a huge field of view. It is the biggest, fastest telescope uh, on the planet today, and it should start in 2023. So do I have any, uh, any questions so far? Garrett, I should tell you that uh, I'm getting, when I try to uh, use a chat, it says chat disabled. And I'm wondering ah. if that's just me or if that's other people. Yeah, I do see that. Um, thank you for that, David. I, I looked at, I see at the bottom, it does say chat disabled. I feel like we went through this before. Jerry, is. I, I think last time we had like people on the call were explaining to us how to sort of um, uh, fix that. But, you know, how about this? Is there anybody that has a question right now? Please unmute yourself and ask. If not, um, Jerry and I can try to fix this chat thing, uh, Mr. Seitzer, while you keep going on. Okay, so I'll just ask for questions every few slides. And um, do we have any questions now? Okay, so I just wanna say that this telescope does not have an eyepiece on it. So you won't be able to go to Chile and uh, put an eyepiece on it and look through it at the night sky. It's all one giant electronic camera. So, so that's not the only thing we're worried about in the night sky. This is an image taken with a Magellan telescope, which is a six and a half meter telescope just north of there. And the University of Michigan owns 10% of both Magellan telescopes. There's a twin of them there, two of them on the same site. And this is the final stage of a rocket body that was launched back in 1968. And it was launched into geosynchronous orbit. And I'll explain that in a matter, in a moment. And so now you can see this streak it's not a uniform streak. So you've got bing, 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 then another bing, bing, bing. So you have groups of three glints or three brightness flashes off the satellite um, as it goes uh, across the night sky. 
So if you ran an automatic uh, detection algorithm on this, you would end up with a string of what would look like galaxies. Excuse me, let me get some water here. <coughs> and so you'd have to be very careful <coughs> in, your, um, in your analysis. These systems take so much data so fast, it's not possible for any human to examine every data frame that there is. So let me just give you a couple of definitions and then I'll pause for questions. When we talk about satellites, we can talk about, there's actually three phases. Tonight, I'm gonna to talk about LEO, which is low Earth orbit, where the altitude is less than 2000 kilometers. And that's where all these new large constellations are coming in. But there's also GEO, which is geosynchronous orbit at 35,767 kilometers. And that's where your dish TV and everything where the satellite, the dishes, the antennas don't move because the satellite is going around the earth at the same time the, or the earth goes around once in its orbit or once in its uh, revolution. So the satellites appear not to move. Finally, let me talk a little bit about the brightness of celestial objects measured in magnitude. Uh, <coughs> astronomers will always invent something new to confuse you. Uh, a difference of five magnitudes is a factor of 100. The larger numbers are fainter. Okay, so 20th magnitude is five magnitudes fainter than 15th magnitude. The faintest you could see by the eye is around seventh magnitude. And you could see several thousand stars at any one time. Now, when I say seventh magnitude, that means you have got exquisite, exquisite vision. You're on a mountaintop somewhere far away from city lights. There's no light pollution at all. And you, you're probably young and your eye hasn't uh, aged at all. But if you're in a city with light pollution, you might be able to see second magnitude and maybe several hundred stars at best. And I think the next shows you an example of the two that I showed you. Uh, you can see the large number of stars here in the left-hand one, which was taken in an observatory site in France, and you can clearly see the Milky Way. But the right one from my driveway in Burns Park is uh, completely, uh, is a different matter. And you could probably see, well, maybe 100, maybe 200 stars max, plus a couple of bright satellites. So you really, if you, if you take nothing away from this talk, is sometime during new moon, when the moon is down, go to a dark sky site and just enjoy the beauty of the night sky, um, particularly if you can get to the Southwestern US or to Chile in South America or the outback in Australia or Namibia and Southern, in Southern Africa. A, a glorious night sky is something to behold. Um, most people have never seen, for example, the Milky Way, our home galaxy, which you see here. Do we have any questions? Okay, we will proceed. So when are satellites visible? Well, a number of things factor in here. The observer has to be in darkness and that depends on the latitude that you're at and the time of year. The satellite has to be in sunlight or penumbra. It can't be in Earth's shadow. And that depends on the orbital inclination, the altitude of the satellite and the time of year. And then it's the brightness of the satellite, the angle between the sun and the satellite and the observer and the characteristics of the satellite, what the attitude, what the orientation of the satellite is, whether it's specular or diffuse reflection, and a whole bunch of other things. So uh, let me give you an example. So this shows you um, the Earth's shadow is a cone. It's not a cylinder. And so you know, I would see a satellite if it was in sunlight here. But if it came, whoops, if it came into Earth's shadow, it would be invisible to me. So if I had an observatory here, which was in darkness, uh, essential for me to see satellites, I could see a satellite that was here, but not here. And notice that it's a cone. And so satellites that are at a higher altitude will be visible longer than satellites that are at a lower altitude. So that's really what we, uh, what we mean. That's really what drives when a satellite is visible. Now I'm assuming that the satellite doesn't glow in the dark. And there are a few satellites that do. Uh, I'm on a couple of projects that are making them. 
so that you can track them in Earth's shadow. But uh, I may get run out of the astronomical community for this, but they will be faint and they'll be very short lived. So any questions on this? Okay, am I still coming through? You are I'm coming through, the chat's working again and um, no questions yet. Okay, so I'm talking about all these new satellites. What's in Earth orbit today? And this is a plot of the monthly norm number of objects in Earth orbit by object type as a function of year, beginning back in 1957 with Sputnik 1, and this goes through the end of 2019. This is from the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office, and this is the number of objects. For astronomers, we're concerned about the top curve. This is everything, the top curve. This is debris, these are satellites, um, and these are spacecraft and rocket bodies, okay? So the sum of all these other curves is the top. And that's the one that astronomers are concerned about because anything that observed that in Earth orbit that reflects sunlight is of concern. Um, there's a public catalog of objects which are larger than 10 centimeters at LEO and one meter at GEO. The catalog is incomplete, probably a factor of two. Okay, it, it's really amazing that we don't have a full census of everything that's in Earth orbit. You'll see some large breaks here. This was a Fengyong 1C anti satellite test back in 2007, a deliberate attempt at creating debris. Uh, this was an accidental collision between an Iridium satellite phone satellite and Cosmos, a dead Soviet satellite, back in 2009. And those two spikes account for about 30% of the objects that are in orbit today. And so you can also see in this curve that sometimes it goes down here and here. And that's when objects that are in low Earth orbit re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and so they are removed from um, distribution. They're removed from the population. Um, that happens naturally. It depends on the orbital altitude. If you're at 400 kilometers, the lifetime is less than five years. If you're at 2000 kilometers, the lifetime is centuries and many, many centuries. And so the curve begins back here in 1957 with Sputnik 1, two objects, Sputnik 1 satellite and the final stage, the final rocket body. The initial catalog of objects in, in space of man-made artificial objects in space was 50% debris, 50% to junk, the satellite and the rocket body. And things have even have gotten either better or worse since then, depending on how you, uh, um, you know, how, what, your, what your concern is. So this is a real problem for, for astronomers and for people involved in space safety. You'll notice this curve going up, okay? And it matches this curve of spacecraft. This is due to all the recent launches. If I add in the thousand or more Starlinks that have come in recently, and this curve is starting to go vertical. It's not going vertical because of debris, although something could be happening as I talk right now, but it's going vertical because of new launches. Um, and it's space is starting to get increasingly congested. Are there any questions on that? Okay. No questions right now. Okay. Um, and so how many of those objects are visible at any one time? in springtime at the Rubin Observatory in Chile. <clears throat> so I took the, uh, the public catalog, which at that time had 18,000 objects in it. And I just asked how many were above 30 degrees elevation, um, which is normal pointing limit for a telescope. And in the middle of the night, there would be between 600 and 700 satellites or pieces of debris or something artificial, which will be in sunlight and above you and presumably you can see, okay? Um, these two red lines are astronomical twilight. That's when the sun is below 18 degrees elevation, more than minus 18 degrees elevation below the horizon. It's when the sky is darkest and when astronomers really prize their time. So if you put objects up in this part of the night, astronomers are gonna be unhappy. Now, most of these objects are small and probably impossible to see or very difficult to see uh, with telescopes. And you certainly wouldn't see them with the unaided eye. 
there's probably a couple of hundred objects that you could see with the unaided eye prior to the launch of Starlink. Okay. One thing you can take away from this, though, is this was a catalog of 18,207 objects. Only about six to 700 of them are visible at any one time. So only a small fraction are visible from any one site, any one location on Earth. Um, let me go forward. This is this is shows you how life is getting. <clears throat> this is really a different topic on um, the uh, growth of the population in low Earth orbit. Let me take a drink of water. <clears throat> and this shows you for three times, January 2000, January 2010, October 2020, <clears throat> altitude versus the number of objects. Well, back in 2000, you might have 100 objects. Things life was pretty well behaved. 2010, 2010, following those two collisions, you see these two spikes, okay, at around 800 kilometers up. Those objects which result from the collision of those two uh, satellites and the anti-satellite test, those objects will be there for centuries, okay? They will not come down naturally. This spike here are starlings, okay? Now, there's now, it's now March, this morning, SpaceX launched another 60 starlings. And so this curve now is over a thousand. Okay, if I just ran this curve up, <clears throat> this is the highest peak <clears throat> of the distribution anywhere. And that's entirely due to starlings. Elon Musk by himself has managed to completely change this plot. And there are a lot of other things down here, uh, which are due to CubeSats that universities and high schools and industry launch. So you can really see how the population at low Earth orbit is changing. Um, so these new large constellations, if we have six to 700 objects visible at any time, why do we care if you've got another 100 or 500 are added from new large constellations? The answer is brightness. These new satellites could be brighter than 99% of all objects in orbit now. That's really what we're concerned about. The new satellites could be brighter than 99% of all the objects in orbit now. And so by the end of 2020, SpaceX had added another 900 satellites to this population. By now, it's easily probably another 300 or 400 satellites beyond that. They're sending things up every two weeks. So it's an issue. So here are some large constellations. Um, some of them are planned. Uh, SpaceX, the bottom line here, it shows the altitude and the inclination, and they're planning to launch, or they have filed for permission to launch 34,408 satellites, all lower than 614 kilometers. Amazon Kuiper, uh, the Kuiper is the name of the Amazon project, has proposed to launch also into low Earth orbit 3,236. And the one that got astronomers really scared was the OneWeb constellation. Um, at 1200 kilometers, and I'll show you why the 1200 kilometer one is so dangerous, various orbital inclinations. And their initial plan was 47,844 satellites. Oh my goodness. I mean, you, the question for astronomers would, would there be more satellites visible than there were um, stars? And so they went through bankruptcy and recently they've announced that they're only going to launch 6,372 satellites. So these are data from public filings with the Federal Communications Commission in the US. Um, now they file with the Federal Communications Commission because they're going to be transmitting to and from these satellites. And if they're transmitting to ground stations in the US or transmitting from ground stations in the US, they need to have permission to do so. Basically, their radio waves need to have a visa or they need landing rights, as I think the uh, proper term is. Um, so these three constellations represent over 70 percent of the known constellations of 107 satellites planned, filed with the FCC or launched in a press release. And astronomers are praying that they're only being launched in a press release and not into anything else. So I'm going to show you some simulations, how many of these satellites will be visible. How bright will they be? 
and our some satellite constellation architecture is more challenging for astronomy. Um, do I have any questions at this point? No questions right now. Okay. Either I'm totally, nobody's understanding it or uh, uh, doing quite well. So let me show you this. Uh, um, let's see what we got here. So I'm gonna show you this animation, which was from a company called AGI that builds uh, uh, software to track satellites. And this shows you 107,000 planned satellites by 2029. And you'll just watch the constellation build up. I hope this is coming across the, uh, the internet. That's the sun in the background. Right now, all we see is the, the slide with the link and the, uh, the black sort of- Oh, I switched to the- uh... Well, maybe this didn't work. Hold on a minute. Let me stop the share, all right? And then I'm gonna share again. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna do it backwards. Okay, so I have to stop the share and redo it, okay? Let's see what we got. So we got it now? Yes. You should see the planet Earth and more and more yep. dots are, uh, are appearing as more and more companies launch satellites. Some of these are large constellations, many of them are small. Okay, I'm gonna stop the share here, start the share again, and go back to my uh, PowerPoint presentation. There we go. So um, now that presentation, that animation didn't show you how they vanish when they go into Earth's shadow, but it did show you that um, there are a lot of satellites coming into low Earth orbit. And the reason that they're coming is that um, it allows you to do worldwide communication. A lot of some of these are radar satellites to monitor the Earth's surface. Um, and surprisingly, it's quicker to go to low Earth orbit, to send your signal to a low Earth orbit satellite, send it by laser to another satellite, and then back down to the ground than it is to use fiber. Um, because for fiber, if you're using fiber optics, the transmission speed is 40% slower than it is of light in air or vacuum, 40% slower. So it's actually quicker to go to a low earth orbit satellite, bounce your send your signal to another satellite and then back down to the ground. Um, and that's why these things are being built. So, um, and people think there's a lot of money in these things. And astronomers hope that there's not, and these companies don't uh, work, but uh, Starlink already has more than a thousand up there. So anyway, there are three phases of a constellation or a satellite's lifetime. Uh, there's the initial mission phase, and this is what got astronomers so excited. This is where you saw this string of pearls right after their launch. They're being checked out, and then eventually they will be orbit raised into a higher orbit. Um, so, and this is what one of the Starlinks look like. This I think is about eight meters. These are, these are big spacecraft in low earth orbit. And you might ask, why didn't astronomers know this was coming? Well, we knew the constellations were coming. We just didn't know that they were gonna be this big because, and this bright. Um, there, were, there were hints, but uh, once the real warning came in May of 2019, when SpaceX put 60 of these into orbit. Um, so there's the second phase is the operational phase. That's where they spend most of their lifetime. And that's where the simulations are reported here um, that I'll show you. Okay, and then there's the deorbit phase. Uh, presumably this is in a high drag configuration. And you can't, you're not supposed to now abandon spacecraft in orbit. This is a bad practice. 
I mean, it's like abandoning cars on the highway if they break down. And right now the guidelines or the, uh, are that you have to get rid of your spacecraft 25 years after the end of mission, okay? So suppose you have a spacecraft that's up for five years and then it runs out of fuel. You have to do something about it within 25 years after end of mission. And you can either cause it to re-enter in the Earth's atmosphere and hopefully burn up totally, or you send it into a higher graveyard orbit. Well, this rule is going to have to change because if you have a car that breaks down on the highway, you don't leave it on the highway for 25 years before you take it away. You get rid of it as quickly as possible because it's a hazard to other traffic. So um, right now, the, what we're seeing is that the plans for Amazon and what uh, SpaceX is doing is they're getting dead satellites. They're getting satellites down within a year, within one year. Um, so perhaps 20% uh, of the object's lifetime. Um, finally, the brightness will be different in all three phases. Um, the distance from the observer to the satellite different and the attitude orientation of the satellite is different. And I haven't even talked about failures where you have an uncontrolled satellite. If you have an uncontrolled satellite at 1200 kilometers, it's centuries before it re-enters in the Earth's atmosphere. If you have an uncontrolled satellite in low Earth orbit at 400 kilometers, it's probably five years. Uh, but let me throw in one more wrinkle here, and that is climate change. Climate change affects the lifetime of satellites. The, if you, the more CO2 you put into the atmosphere, the warmer, the lower part of the atmosphere becomes, but the upper part of the atmosphere cools. And so there's less drag on satellites. So there's a recent study that came out that uh, estimates that satellite lifetimes at 400 kilometers with, uh, will be 30% longer if the 1.5 degree C target is met. If it isn't met, then they'll be even longer after that. So climate change affects everything. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Do I have any questions so far? Yeah, there's one that's uh, it's kind of timely as you're talking about some of these um, sort of rules or expectations. Uh, this is from Mary Emerson. One, she says, this is crazy. Um, and then she asked, uh, is there a control board to handle the amount and dissemination of satellites? So is there, well, there are various organizations that, that deal with these matters. The FCC in the United States, if you're going to transmit to a U.S. ground station, uh, controls the frequencies. It controls the altitudes of the satellites, sort of. And you have to file an orbital debris mitigation plan. That is how you are going to minimize the creation of orbital debris um, on Earth. I mean, once you get on orbit, once you launch. And you have to have a good plan or they, they won't approve it. Um, but are there any rules? Are there any international laws that say you can't launch? No. Um, uh, certainly there, is, there are no international regulations on the brightness of satellites. None whatsoever. There are no national regulations on the brightness of satellites. So um, the, there are international guidelines on uh, the deorbit phase, you know, within 25 years or five years or graveyard orbits or burn up. And I would say the companies here recognize that it's in their best interest, at least Amazon, OneWeb and SpaceX recognize it's in their best interest not to leave stuff hanging around in orbit uh, forever. But these companies are, are trying to put more and more spacecraft into a narrow region of space around uh, 600 kilometers up. And uh, it's, uh, it's gonna be an issue that has to be uh, sorted out. So did I answer, sort of answer that question? Yeah, I, I think so. And, and it, I think it's sort of stimulated another follow-up from Dave and, and Lynn Cottrell, um, wouldn't the companies just declare bankruptcy and then not have to pay the cost of deorbiting? Oh, oh, oh. uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, declare bankruptcy and just leave your junk in orbit. Um, yeah, no, I, I you know, uh, OneWeb declared bankruptcy and they had, 
I think something like 74 satellites already in orbit at 1200 kilometers. Uh, maybe some were still at 600. But no, if they declare bankruptcy and go out of business, who, who cleans up the mess? It turns out that the launching country, um, the launching country is responsible for objects going into space. So in this case, I believe they were launched from the US and so the US would hold responsibility for it. But they might've been launched from the Soviet. I think they were actually launched from Russia. Um, but it is the launching country that eventually has responsive, that has final responsibility. But it's a real good point. You know, it's an excellent point. Somebody's got to clean up this mess. Are there any other questions? That's it for right now. Okay. Okay. So I'm just gonna. So I'm just gonna go through this fast since we seem to be uh, running through some time here. Um, I just modeled the Starlinks when they will be visible. I used the public filings, the telescopes in darkness, the satellites in sunlight. And the satellite is more than 30 degrees above the horizon. And the red lines and plots are when the night sky is darkest. You observe the faintest stars and galaxies. So here's the first one. This is one constellation of 1,584 satellites at 550 kilometers. This is in winter, uh, minus 30 degrees latitude. And this is the darkest part of the night between these two red lines. So prior to that, these satellites are in sunlight. Okay, and you can see if you have 1,584 satellites, you probably have only between seven and nine satellites above 30 degrees elevation at any one time. And within an hour after the end of astronomical twilight, the thing has gone to zero. The satellites are still there, but they're not in sunlight. And so you have most of them the night and there's nothing visible. Good news. Okay, now we're in the spring or fall. This would be in either March or September. Now you're starting to get a little bit longer into astronomical twilight, but most of the night is still uh, uncontaminated by satellites. So you've got nothing but meteors and aircraft and stars. Great stuff. We go to summer. This would be the shortest night of the year. Again, you have about three hours in the middle of the night when there are no starlings visible. Okay. The nights get, keep getting shorter and shorter as these red lines get closer and closer together. And after this, the nights will start to get longer again. Now, this is for 1,584 satellites. You can multiply that by 10 for 15,000 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50, depending how more. And that will tell you the number of satellites that are visible if they were all at this 550 kilometer altitude. Suppose the SpaceX constellation was originally gonna launch to 1,150 kilometers, okay? originally going to launch to 1150. Had they done that during the summer, 1584 satellites, the satellites are visible all night long. Even in the middle of the night, uh, the darkest part of the sky, you would still have 10 Starlink visible at any one time. Now they would be in the southern part of the sky in Chile, um, just because of the orientation of Earth's shadow. So they're higher altitude, they're visible for longer, but they would be for fainter. So here get, here's a, a simulation with 10,000 satellites. There's 100 planes with 100 satellites per plane. The inclination is 53 degrees. There's 10,000 satellites at 500 kilometers and 10,000 satellites at 1,000 kilometers. Again, summer 30 degrees latitude. You can see that during the night, the middle of the night, the high altitude ones are always visible. You'll have 40 satellites visible. This is for 10,000 satellites. You can multiply that by 10 if you have 100,000 satellites, and all of a sudden you got 400 objects visible. And you can see that 500 kilometers, they're dark. They, they will not be in sunlight, and so you still have good dark sky in, in the middle of the night. Um, suppose OneWeb had launched their original constellation of 47,844 satellites at 1,200 kilometers. And astronomers were screaming at one way. So this is the elevation of more than 30 degrees um, and three different inclinations. They have a, a polar orbit inclination, a population of objects at 55 degrees inclination, and a population of objects at 40 degrees inclination. The curve we're concerned about is here. This one constellation itself at 1,200 kilometers would have 500 satellites visible in the middle of the night primarily in the south. Um, 
if you, right at astronomical twilight, there would be a thousand satellites visible in the sky above 30 degrees elevation. Um, and uh, it's scary. I mean, it really would be scary. So we're not too, uh, fortunately they've decided to scale back, but I would say the warning is, these are the constellations we know about. We don't know about the Chinese constellations. They don't have to file with the FCC or the Russian constellations. The Europeans will be good partners in this. They're well aware of, of the issue. The other issue is that there are many small constellations of 10 to 50 satellites being planned. Well, you start out with one small constellation, then you got 10, and then you got 100, and all of a sudden you have a large number of satellites to worry about. Um, are there any questions on what I've presented so far? Um, Jim Woodyard had a, had a question, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll just read it. He said, possible to require the satellite owner to force the satellite to slow down and burn up as it falls through the atmosphere. <clears throat> so is it possible? Yeah. Um, so that has to do with the lifetime of the satellites. The natural lifetime of a satellite at 1200 kilometers is century. And so in order for them to meet the 25 year rule or better a five-year rule or even better a one-year rule, they will have to have active uh, propulsion on the satellite. Most of the satellites in these large constellations will have active propulsion on them and they will be constantly maneuvering and they will be maneuvering around other satellites as well. Um, certainly all the SpaceX constellations will do that. Um, I heard a presentation given by OneWeb personnel and they insisted that the, the system with the highest reliability on their satellites was the deorbit system so that they would come down uh, even if everything else failed. And the OneWeb satellites will also, I believe, have a grapple fixture on them. So even if everything died, they can send another mission up and grab that satellite and cause it to re-enter. Now, there's another topic there, which is worth another uh, talk. You want them to burn up completely in the Earth's atmosphere uh, and not have anything reach the Earth's surface. Um, there's a program that's called Design for Demise. But the other issue is, which is starting to get some attention, if you have 100,000 satellites re-entering, what about all the alumina particles that you're leaving in the upper atmosphere? Um, so there are environmental aspects there as well. I'm not an, ask, an expert in any of that, but I have seen some studies going on. Um, did I answer that question or are there other questions? No, I think that's it for right now. Yeah, the environmental implications of all of this uh, satellite launches are, are extend beyond um, just astronomy. So, so this shows you, um, let me see, did I miss a slide? Oh, okay. So we started meeting with, the, uh, with SpaceX within a couple of months after their initial launch, and they were getting all this publicity about how Elon Musk will single-handedly ruin the night sky. So they've, they've done a couple of things now. First of all, when their satellites are, I'm going to start on the right side here. When the satellites are on station, they will be in what's called a shark fin configuration, this L-shaped thing. When they're orbit raising from their initial orbit up to 550, they'll be in this open book configuration like this. And they have now put them so that this is edge on to most observers. So, whoops, you don't see, let me go back here. You don't see them. And so what we're hearing now or what we're seeing now is that there are reports of these satellites in the first 24 or 48 hours after launch. So there were reports this evening of uh, the satellites that were launched this morning. The other thing that they've done, and th then they become invisible or certainly fainter than sixth magnitude. The other thing they've done is they put sun visors on them so that the sun doesn't hit this particular side of the spacecraft where the antennas are and which is quite bright. Um, and that has mitigated them down. They're fainter now by about a factor of four. So let me go back one. So this shows you the, um, the brightness of one visor sat 
a satellite that had visors uh, at station. This is from a Russian automated observatory. And the goal is to make them fainter than seven, okay? And that, that's a pretty hard limit. Most people can't see that faint. There are people, in fact, that can see stuff fainter than seven that are gifted with exquisite vision. But this is a number, once you send it out into the community, you don't wanna come back and revisit. Um, so sixth magnitude here, you'd be able to see them at a really dark sky, even, even with my elderly eyes. So, um, and the one web satellites, the target is seven. Most of them are fainter than that. They will still saturate detectors on very fast telescopes like the Vera Rubin, like the four meter Blanco. So let me just do the conclusions. Um, the large constellations at LEO are coming and they're coming fast. There's new satellites that are gonna be brighter than 99% of the current objects in orbit. Only a small fraction of the total constellation is visible at any one time. So if people were to launch 100,000 satellites at 600 kilometers, you might see a few percent above you at any one time, um, but that could still be a large number. The string of pearls does not represent the final operational state, but it could be a real challenge to optical astronomy if many launches happen in a short time. So, you know, suppose you have 10,000 satellites up in a steady state configuration and they last five years. Well, that means every year you have to replace 20% of them, okay? So you would have 20% of that population going up and 20% coming down. So every year you would have 4,000 satellites in motion, 2,000 going up and 2,000 coming down. So just keeping the constellation fully populated results in a large number of objects being launched and re-entering. In this case, it's better to have them last a long time, like 10 years. If there was only one constellation of 1,584 satellites launched, astronomers can handle this, multiply this by 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. And um, so, and the largest uncertainty is who launches what, when, and where, and not filed with the FCC. For example, uh, the Department of Defense does not file um, satellites that are in national security. They are not in that catalog. Um, they don't file with the FCC for obvious reasons. So finally, there were a couple of workshops that have been held so far on this. SATCON 1, Satellite Constellation 1, uh, which was run by the American Astronomical Society last June. And these are the websites on it. It taught a report on impact of satellite constellations on optical astronomy. And there was a Dark and Quiet Skies for Science and Society, uh, which is run by the International Astronomical Union um, and a shorter UN report which is coming out of that. One of the topics that's interesting but hasn't gotten a lot of attention is that there are um, animals and birds that use the night sky for navigation and what the effect of large numbers of satellites, moving satellites will have on them on their migratory pattern. So with that, I close and I'm happy to uh, take any additional questions. Whew. Thank you very much. We've got some questions, but I think maybe we're quiet because there's that, that saying in space, no one can hear you scream. <laughs> some pretty astounding stuff you just shared with us. Um, so I, I really would say just a, in conclusion that my, um, yeah, I can bring up the chat channel now and just see what's going on. My feeling is that my prediction is that most of the satellites, the constellations and stuff that will be launched now, you will not see except in extraordinary circumstances in most cases. They will be fainter than magnitude six. There'll be a lot of satellites between magnitude six and magnitude seven. Um, and then there'll be a tremendous number fainter than magnitude seven, between magnitude seven and magnitude 10 which will just, which will be a huge problem for astronomers, for astrophotographers. If you were to go out and take some beautiful pictures of the night sky, you'd have to take multiple ones and filter them to get rid of all the trail. So um, that's just my, um, you know, my, my view on that. So anyway, 
wonder if I could ask about uh, how you use the word constellations. Uh, it's not clear to me whether a constellation is made up of discrete particles that result from uh, a collision or whatever, or are these constellations uh, discrete uh, objects that are uh, launched at the same time? Okay, but good questions. When, when we refer to constellations in this case, we refer to an organized uh, population of satellites that are launched by one particular operator. And they're all in a particularly organized fashion in terms of their orbital altitude, their orbital inclination, how many satellites are in each plane. Um, so it's a very organized um, population of objects that are launched by one particular operator. In this case, SpaceX launching 1584. Did I answer your question? Somewhat, but are there companies or entities that are sending thousands of these up at a time? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. SpaceX has launched over a thousand in the last two years. No, I mean at one time. Uh, you know, no, they're a... launching 60 at a time. The biggest launches have been 140. I believe that SpaceX uh, will eventually plan to launch 400 satellites at once. But right and, now, the, launch, the record for the number of satellites launched at once is about 140. And, and for what purpose are they sending up, you know, 400 satellites? Is it a communication system? You know, what is it? Uh, SpaceX is launching for communications for high-speed internet um, to be able to um, uh, transmit internet uh, to rural areas and to, um, you know, low-density populations. Um, if you look on the FCC websites, and here's where the American Astronomical Society treads lightly, um, there's a huge discussion um, with a lot of objections from other operators for how SpaceX is launching satellites into polar orbits. And you launch into polar orbits to cover uh, a region like Alaska. But there are these letters from, from people in Alaska that say, you know, give us, give us internet, because right now, you know, we have something that's costing us $500 a month for some primitive, you know, very low bandwidth internet. So, uh, you know, for these rural areas and underserved populations, it's, uh, it really, it's essential, so. Is there any uh, theoretical way to go up and get them out of space? Is there any way to go out and get them? It's an area of huge study right now. It's called ADR, active debris removal, where you go up and you remove a dead spacecraft and cause it to re-enter into the Earth's atmosphere. Um, yeah, there are some significant technical and political challenges. Uh, technical challenges are you're talking about going up and grabbing something the size of a city bus, which is tumbling. It may have rocket fuel still on board. The batteries may still be live. Okay. Um, and uh, you want to go up, you want to grab that without causing any more debris, any new debris, and cause it to re enter into the Earth's atmosphere, <coughs> presumably into the Southwest Pacific to a point called Point Nemo, uh, which is the point most distant from uh, all land and island. So even if something does come down, it would go into the, the possibility of an impacting an inhabited area is quite small. But active debris removal is very expensive, um, but there are a large number of people pursuing it because it turns out the most dangerous objects in orbit um, in terms of creating debris in the future are large rocket bodies that collide with other large objects and create a you know, more of those spikes in the population distribution that I saw you. So you wanna go up and get those out um, mm -hmm. before they have a chance to collide with something else. Could you explain the 30 degree incline a little bit more? I never quite caught. Does the telescope all, can only go 30 degrees or greater to a vertical? Or? Right, that, that, that's what it is. And I should come up with a diagram. Um, most, teles most telescopes can point lower. I mean, the telescopes that I use can point down to 15 degrees elevation, okay, which is quite low. Um, but there's, the reason you don't point 
so low and why 30 degrees is sort of a limit for a lot of them is the atmosphere. The lower you go in the atmosphere, the more of the atmosphere you're looking through um, and you have more extinction, more light is absorbed. The image quality is worse. Uh, the stars are bouncing around a little bit more. Um, so 30 degrees is sort of a, uh, a working limit for most cases. Um, mm -hmm. Did I answer your question in that case? Yes, and uh, as far as climate change goes, the more carbon dioxide we put in the air, the hotter, the lower atmosphere becomes, and that makes the upper atmosphere cooler. And I'm cool. sorry, could you tell me one more time what occurs because of that? Well, if the upper atmosphere is cooler, right, uh, it doesn't go up as high, right? And so there's less drag on satellite, okay? You have less atmosphere up there. Um, and so there's less drag on satellites. And so the satellite lifetime is longer. Okay, gotcha. So, it, you know, it's, it, I, I, I first saw this effect in a paper back in 2005. And now the same gentleman has a, um, PhD thesis student coming out with a paper where they modeled it. Um, and it looks pretty convincing and, you know, just, well, I don't have to tell this group that climate change is, it is, it, it, I mean, I think the lesson I want you to take here is climate change affects everything. It even affects space travel. Mm -hmm. uh, if anybody else has a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask it. it um, just, uh, uh, if I could get a couple of the, the questions from the chat, um, in there. Um, uh, while mm -hmm. people are thinking about uh, that invitation from Jerry. Um, there is a question here. Uh, um, if you remember, if Doc Hazel Lash is still remembered at the UM Astronomy Department. Uh, yes, she is. Um, that, uh, um, I think we have her picture on the website somewhere, but uh, no, she was, uh, she was quite a famous figure uh, in Michigan astronomy. I think Dave Richards thought there was going to get, he, he expected a little bit of a smile from that question. He got a big thumbs up. Um, Dave Richards also asked, uh, sent me a message a little earlier saying that he, he read a lengthy uh, New Yorker magazine um, late last year um, that was talking about space, space debris, but, but more in the perspective of the danger to um, uh, space missions with, you know, humans up there and the danger to humans when, when they're up there. Um, just, I think he was interested in a comment or an observation from you on that. You know, uh, so what is the danger to human space flight? It's uh, increasing. The there you go. One of the most uh, up there. studied um, uh, surfaces are some solar panels that came down from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and there are some, I mean, I, I could go on this for hours, but um, there you see these impact craters on the spacecraft surfaces that have come back from uh, come back from orbit, and the some of them are micrometeorites, and some of them are small space debris like paint flecks. So, for example, when the space shuttle was still flying, they were I und I believe replacing the space shuttle windshields after every mission, uh, just because of the impact of something the size of a paint fleck at ten thousand miles an hour and the damage it would have. So um, there are pictures of, you know, damage to the International Space Station and the like. So it's a real problem. Uh, or Mary Emerson has fatalities or casualties on orbit yet. Sorry about that. Sorry about cutting you off. Uh, Mary Emerson asked if you thought there should be an international board um, to manage this dilemma. Well, it's, it's should there be an international board? Um, you know, physics doesn't know any boundaries. And so we can tighten up the regulations in the United States, but that might cause companies to go to countries that have less regulation. So yes, there would have to be a uniform planetary wide um, standard that everybody agreed to. Um, and I will just pass on how difficult that might be to achieve. Um, I think the way forward is for, um, for the astronomical community to work with companies like SpaceX and OneWeb and Amazon, and all three are in contact with the American Astronomical Society and with the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory people to try to solve this problem because 
they don't want to be known as the ones that, um, uh, you know, ruin data from uh, the Rubin Observatory. There's something to be said about the press. I think I see that that Ed um, has a question he wants to ask, but if I could just get this one in there from the chat before you ask your question, Ed. Um, this one's from David Kelly, and it says, uh, how do observers plan to compensate for continue, continued debris? Okay, um, well, there, there's a couple of things. At some point, if you get so many satellites in orbit, there's basically no mitigation possible. And that's basically, I think, at about the 10,000 satellite level, um, 10,000 bright satellites. At, um, you could, if you were doing long exposures and you knew the orbits well enough, you could close the shutter uh, when the satellite was going to cross the field of view and then open it afterwards. So if you were doing 300 seconds or 600 seconds, you could close the shutter for two seconds, let the satellite go across and then open the shutter again. So that's one way. You could schedule your telescope during the night to avoid the, the worst of the satellite. So obviously Rubin Observatory and others will schedule their telescope so that the International Space Station, which is as bright as Venus, it's the brightest object in the night sky these days, um, you don't have it cross your field of view because it would cause quite, it, it would cause chaos. Um, but you're still gonna have a large number of streaks and the way to do, to get away from them is to take multiple exposures. So uh, Rubin Observatory and the LSST project will probably take two 15 second exposures um, and the hope is that both one of them will be clear. The trails will cover a small fraction of the area of the image, um, but it's unlikely that you'll have a trail that will wipe out both exposures. So you do multiple exposures, you do clever scheduling, uh, you can do active shuttering. Um, all of this depends on that you have a very accurate catalog of objects and a database of their orbits. Okay. Can I can I uh, make a statement? Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. The reason um, all these sat satellites and Starlinks are going up is to have global 5G. Okay. And you have these tens of thousands of launches um, that use dirty fuel, create more um, black soot in the upper atmosphere which probably will also uh, affect astronomy. And the um, 5G is so unnecessary. Alaska and the rest of the world can be connected with cell towers or fiber optics. So fiber optics is 40% slower than 5G, but the countries that have the highest speed broadbands use fiber optics. So um, there's a way around this. 5G uses four to five times the greenhouse gas emissions of 4G. And 4G is already 2% of worldwide emissions. So um, I just wanted to insert that. And uh, I'm campaigning against 5G, as you can tell. And, and the beamed radiation is not safe. Um, and Elon Musk, one other final factor, Elon Musk wants 1 million ground stations and you have no choice as an individual or a community as to where these are placed. These can be placed, these antennas can be placed on your house, in your yard, it's the FCC OTARD rule, call it, and a declaratory rule that they can put up 5G towers anywhere. Nobody can, you know, it's, it's total corporate control of democracy. So I just wanted to get that in too. Okay. So I, I will just add one thing there. The frequencies that Elon Musk and the Starlinks used are completely different from those used by 5G. And the uh, ground stations are, are, are not 5G ground stations. Oh, okay, I didn't know that, okay. So do we have any other questions or comments or 
see a, I see a hand raised um, uh, on our uh, on our screen. And sorry, I recognize um, your face, but I can't remember your name right now. I see you listed as iPad on the uh, the screen. I apologize for not being able to recall your name right now. I'm going to unmute you just in case. Is that Gail? I'm trying to unmute, but I can't do it. Yeah, we can't. We can't hear you. We we can't hear you. I think you, you're you're muted. I tried to unmute you. I can't. Still can't. Still can't hear you. Maybe we can go on to another question. Uh, if anyone else has some, and come back to um, to Gail. Yeah, Gail, try to un, un, unmute, and uh, we'll come back to you. See if that works out. Does anybody else have another question? See Patrick Livingston, your your mute was off. Is that because he had a question? Jerry, are you able to unmute Gail? No. No. Okay. Maybe you could type it in, Gail. Use SOS. I'm listening to the to that book by uh, the Martian, and uh, that's how they communicate. That's how. Uh, What's his name? Matt Damon's character communicates with NASA when they lose communication. He uses big old rocks on Mars to use Morse code to, to communicate. Any other questions? Mary, Mary did say um, thank you very much for um, the, the presentation, uh, for the interesting presentation. OK, um, Garrett. We have no more questions. Uh, let's have a hand for Mr. Seitzer, please, everyone. Yay, Mr. Seitzer. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Mr. Seitzer, aren't you part of uh, the Michigan Dark Skies website? Uh, yes, I am. And how could people uh, join or, or see that uh, website? That's the University of Michigan Dark Skies website. Uh, yeah, I'll have to send you an email. Um, uh, Sally Oy is the one that uh, takes care of it and is the driving force behind it. I, I will find the website and send you an email with it. And you can propagate it to all of your uh, members. Okay, sounds good. Thank you much for the. Thank you very much for the presentation. We appreciate You're welcome. It. Oh, thanks everybody okay. for joining us. Okay, bye. Have a bye. good evening, bye. people. Bye. Sorry, Gail, we couldn't get you off mute. Good night. Good night, everybody. Thank you. You're Good welcome. to see Ajay. See you there under the tulips. <laughs> like that background. Pretty interesting, completely off topic. So the bink may be going through some renovations and we brainstormed how to take nature and kind of flip it. And one uh -huh. of those things is perspective. So we're reimagining part of our hallway as if you were like an ant. And this is the perspective of an ant as if it was in the grass looking up in a flower. Yeah, bed. I like it. So this is like a taste of what we might um, see at the, the new uh, Belle Isle Nature Center? Yep. Sweet. I love is, it. Is there a new Belle Isle Nature Center coming? No, no. But because we are currently closed, um, we may capitalize on this time and start um, planning some renovations, which are desperately needed all throughout the island. Um, so we're having those conversations and what that looks like and if we could. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing to keep in mind, if we do renovations this year or this even this summer, we will have to find a different placement for ESI, like a physical location. Palmer Park. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. What's ESI? Palmer Park. Um, so ESI is a um, summer youth employment program for 16 to 19 year olds. Um, and it's a program that will run for eight weeks during the summer and kids can get um, job readiness skills, um, mentoring, they're learning environmental skills. So everything from aging a tree to identifying plants. Um, they learn other life skills like financial um, budgeting, um, how to apply for a loan or a grant or a scholarship, resume work. Um, and then we do service projects. And that may be, uh, for example, we helped um, Garrett scout and um, plan a trail that's in Rouge Park. Um, we've, some of my interns have created interpretive signage for a sensory based, um, trail. We've done, um, 
We created benches and picnic tables for the state parks. We clear cut an area. So we've done a lot of environmental work within the city. Mm -hmm. Maybe we could, uh, you know, this summer, Dr. Jeff Ram, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that his lab, you know, his Wayne State lab will be fully operational. He, he's got all of this stuff at the, the den in Palmer Park. Maybe there's an opportunity to do some stuff with, uh, with Dr. Ram, you know? Yeah, I have it all written down. I'm going to talk to Amy soon about it. Um, we just got approved for group travel because as of right now, we can't travel, um, like two employees can't travel together at the zoo. Um, yeah, which okay. kind of threw a wrench in things. But now that we can travel as a bus, that means that we can have a decent cohort size. We can still go out and do our things in Brighton or Howell um, if we wanted to um, and keep much of the activities that we usually do. Another thing- Do you have is, your own bus? Do you already have your own transportation? No. Oh, I got it. I'm gonna send you, I'm gonna put a link in the chat right now for a really okay. cool organization. But keep and talking. Another thing about this, it's a paid experience and um, like kids get to go kayaking, um, we go camping, we go to high ropes course. They even they even spin, um, harvest it and spun their own honey. So we've done some amazing things and we've worked with Garrett in the past. So that's actually how we got to know each other. Mm -hmm. Another thing about Belle Isle is, so we've been trying to make Belle Isle a designation of Dark Sky Park. And that effort started in uh, December of 2019 and we are still at it. We're trying to get on the agenda of the BIPAC, which is the Bell Isle uh -huh. Advisory Committee. I'm sorry? Advisory Committee? Yes, Advisory Committee. We're trying to get on the April agenda to make a, a presentation to move this forward. So interesting. Fingers crossed. All right. Yeah. Have you guys, any of you been to the Headlands in Northern Michigan? Yes, I have. Yeah, it's been actually a goal of mine to get up there and life just keeps happening and I haven't made it. Well, um, Headlands is really cool, but I tell you what, if you can get to Wilderness State Park, you can go another 10 miles away from mm -hmm. Mackinac City. And so that's okay. where I, I always book a cabin there for the Perseid shower. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not supposed to be at the end of the island. So we go and lay down on the on the on the beach, and then a ranger comes with a flashlight. Go, why are you here? We go, we're looking at the at the uh, Perseid shower, and he goes, okay, well, when you leave, you know, maybe be careful. I say, okay, bye bye. And then you're seeing like 25 uh, meteors an hour, and it's really a great place. It, I think it's better than the Headlands, but the Headlands probably would not like to hear anyone say that. So <laughs> you didn't hear it. All right. Does everybody know where the Headlands is? I've never been. Yeah, well, and I, don't before, know. No, I don't know. One exit before you start hitting Mackinac City, okay. uh, it, and there's a sign, and you just go west, and it's probably about maybe um, six miles or so. And uh, so, okay. international. Okay. It's just because there are certain the, the state dark of Michigan, sky park. Yeah, the state of Michigan okay. has just declared dark sky parks, but that's completely different than the International Dark Sky Association. Okay. Is This one is a, a dark sky association. The, the state of Michigan just simply declares it and that's it's there. There's no really, um, you know, particular um, parameters for it. They just say it, it is and, and it is. Whereas the uh, IDA, you have to meet a lot of specifications. Yeah. And, and Bell Isle meets those? I wonder because it's an island like smack dab in, in the middle of two big cities. So I will wonder uh -huh. how. Well, it's yeah. actually, we're not seeking a dark sky um, designation. We're seeking an urban night sky place. So out of the five things that um, that we're trying, that an urban night sky place tries, tries to do, three of them have to do with educating the cities around it. So it would be largely trying to educate Southeast Michigan and Windsor about dark sky lighting. Okay, that's, that's really interesting. Stuff. I might mm -hmm. talk to you further about that. Okay, sounds good. Because we also, um, and I'm really excited to get these started back up. Um, Erin Parker, who is the, um, she's actually the director of conservation, I believe right now. So her job title has changed and she will eventually be running the Great Lakes Nature Center. She does a lot of uh, nighttime um, environmental uh, programs. So 
whether that's night hikes or, um, and the night hikes can take very uh, various shapes. So like we may focus on like owls or um, just calls at night, that sort of thing. So they differ. That may be something uh, we may add to um, our programming yeah. as well. We're always looking for support. So great, that would be wonderful. Yeah. Cool. Well, Ajay, I put that the link for the boat bus um, in there. Check them out. The, 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 the program has moved to the, relocated to the Midwest. The bus is in Milwaukee right now. We're actually okay. going to use it next week, but it's a really cool bus for transporting groups um, to go out and do outdoor adventure. <laughs> All right. Thanks for this, Garrett. Sure. And if you can find budget and if, if, if uh, Amy can get you budget to buy some cool, like, um, sun shelters or, or, or group tents set those up in palmer park and you got outdoor like classroom space and um, awesome. just come on jump in yeah, the mix it'll be so great have to have you up there tent. um and we're we're not strangers to being outside all day and that that's not really the nope. issue is yeah. we just need like decent bathrooms and maybe somewhere to store a cooler like we are very self-sufficient um and we we travel like we can check those boxes <laughs> yeah yeah Ajay, we should talk about this before all right I also got a, um, a forwarded email from Antonio about all the Palmer Park work and all the um, projects that are going on. Okay. Oh, like the, 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 the public conversations, like the, they want to have some uh, like input uh, about the stewardship conversations at Lake Francis and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. I'm glad with that. Yeah. Cool. Hey, I wanted to mention my friend Sandra Jones, who's on, the, um, on here from uh, Sterling Heights. Sandra, can you say hi? Maybe not, but that's okay. She's there. I see Gail got Gail got off mute. Hello. Oh, no, Sandra. It looks like oh, Sandra. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Every time I send out an email, goes Sandra goes. Thank you for sending this. I'm like, whoa! Somebody said thank you. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Sandra. Oh, this has been a pleasure. I love hearing all these topics. It's wonderful. Cool. Gail, what about is is your mic working now? Uh, there we yeah. go. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Ah, uh, I. I know the camera went off, but we can hear you. Okay. You know what? I just but I'm sorry. The That's mic okay. is working. I was yeah. I pressed the wrong button though. Yeah, I I just got this iPad. I don't know how to work it. I know it's different on an iPad versus like a computer. That's like the story of my life this past year. I pressed the wrong button. So I think we all understand. Thank you, I'm, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> God oh, damn well. <laughs> You're in good company, I'm sure. At least you are with me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. That was yeah, a good yeah. uh, meeting, very interesting. Yeah, it really was. Thank you, Jerry, for, for lining up that speaker and doing the rearranging to get them to come out tonight. Well, come to think of it, this has all been recorded, so maybe I should hit the, the quit recording button here, I guess. Yeah, maybe go back and edit the part where you're saying, like, uh, the international dark sky park's better than the other sky dark sky park. <laughs> I know. They're going to put up a, a picture, like, if you ever see this guy at night, like, hanging out on the beach, give him the boot. That's right. Tell him to go to wilderness. <laughs> go to, yeah, head into the wilderness. Well, I like it just so... <laughs> No, dear. Okay, well, I guess we better get off here because I don't know how to quit recording it. And, and oh, 